Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Dr. Madeleine Ola here. I'm a family physician at the Family Medicine Department, and we welcome you to our monthly broadcast um, as part of the Funda Fridays, uh, the HIV and, and TB case discussions. Um, and every last Friday of the month, we are very happy to be broadcasting um, live from our boardroom. Um, I'm actually not in the boardroom today. I'm at the East London Resource Center for another workshop. Um, and so I'm very happy to hand over to our host today, Dr. Simon Cumley will be assisting with some of the technicalities. Um, and we are very pleased that Dr. Nell um, has spent a lot of times with Dr. Fuentes to prepare this, pre this presentation on the ENT manifestations of HIV. And I would like to hand over to them now. Um, just a reminder to please put your names and MP, your MP or SANAC numbers in the, um, in the chat for, for, for attendance purposes. Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, very exciting, um, interesting um, uh, aspect of HIV medicine today. Um, so thanks very much, Dr. Null, for preparing this. I look forward to the presentation. I'm sure we're all going to learn quite a bit. I know I will. All right, we can start when you're ready. Hey, morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Nell. Um, I'm one of the interns currently work, working in Ward 5. And yeah, today's presentation will be about the ENT manifestations of HIV. So um, just an overview of what we will be discussing. I'll do a short introduction and in some epidemiology. Then I will go through a little bit of anatomy and the clinical presentation and treatment, and then a summary. So HIV and AIDS um, is much more common in the African content than in the Western countries. Um, ENT manifestations um, can present at all stages of the disease. More than half of HIV infected patients presents with ENT manifestations. And um, it, it's, it, it's quite a polymorphic presentation and it's often the first presentation um, to the consultation room. So just uh, um, looking at the World Health Organization staging and um, what the things that I'm gonna be discussing that actually occur in the staging um, is generalized adam and adenopathy in clinical stage one. Clinical stage two, we have recurrent oral ulceration and angular teleitis. Then clinical stage three, oral hairy leukoplakia, as well as persistent oral candidiasis. Then stage four, we have esophageal or airway candida infection, kaposic sarcoma, extra pulmonary tuberculosis, CMV, and then a lymphoma lymphoma or other solid HIV tumors. Okay, so moving on to the epidemiology. Um, so this was just a cross-sectional descriptive study with prospective data collection that was done um, in um, the Donka National Hospital. The study um, was um, done over six months from 2019 to 2020. And um, uh, Odonka National Hospital is in Guinea. I wasn't aware of that. I had to go Google that. I mean, <laughs> interesting. Um, but so they um, interviewed, fifth, had fifth, 522 participants, of which 208 were HIV zero positive, which is a percentage of 39.8%. And of the, um, the um, participants, 62.5% uh, were women. The mean age were 40. 2.21 with extremes of age between 16 and 40, uh, sorry, 64. And um, the, the age group that had the most participants was between 35 and 44 years, which cons, um, um, was 33.1%. And then on the image on the right, you can see what their findings. So um, the in um, nose and sinuses diseases was um, present in 55.7%. Oral cavity and um, pharyngolaryngeal presentations was in 50.9%. Autological presentations in 43.7% and cervicofacial presentations in 7.7%. It's just important to note that none of the ENT manifestations is specific to the disease. Then moving on to another study that was published for a um, publishing house of the remaining academy in 2021. 
Um, this was a study done from 2009 to 2021. They found that 80% of HIV positive patients develop ENT involvement. So it's quite important to have a high index of suspicion. The most common manifestation occurred in oral disease, about 40 to 50%. And the risk factors that they identified was a CD4 less than 200, smoking, poor oral hygiene, xerosomia, HIV RNA of more than 3,000 copies. Then the oral manifestations that they found included oral candidiasis, hair, oral hair leukoplakia, recurrent foot and mouth disease, neoplasms, including carposis sarcoma and lymphomas, condition caused by herpes simplex, shingles, and hemopapilloma virus, periodontal disease, and oral tuberculosis. The nasal manifestations included acute and chronic rhinosinusitis, allergic rhinitis, neoplasms, including carposis sarcoma and lymphoma. Then uh, manifestations in the neck it was enlarged lymph nodes, involvement of the salivary gland, and then autological manifestations included acute and chronic otitis media, secretory otitis media, otitis externa, polyps and the of the, in the external ordinary canal, neoplasms, again, Kaposi sarcoma, and then sensory hearing loss and perif peripheral facial um, paralysis. And then this was also a study done by Tanzania, Northern Tanzania. It was a descriptive cross-sectional study published in 2020. So as you can see in the very nice um, graph that we have on the um, screen, um, the most common presentation was rhinosinusitis, followed by tonsillitis, then esophageal candidiasis, and then cervical lymph adenopathy. So, um, also, the study um, done by Tanzania, they um, looked at the CD4 count and the ENT manifestations. So they found that the ENT manifestations decreased as the CD4 count increased. So it's plausible that a person's CD4 count drops and then the person becomes more prone to opportunistic infections and the likelihood of developing ENT manifestations of part of the opportunistic infection increases. Some of the ENT conditions um, recognized are recognized as opportunistic infections in HIV. So it's impo particularly important to look um, at people with a CD4 count below 500. Um, so it should be screened for um, ENT manifestations. So moving on to a, a short classification. So we can classify the ENT manifestations into infectious and non infectious. On the infectious side, we have bacteria, viral, and fungal. And on on the non-infectious side, we have benign and malignant. So bacterial infections that are common in ENT um, in HIV patients is strep pyogenes, Neisseria gonorrhea, diphtheria, mycoplasma pneumonia, TB pneumonas, Staph aureus, Haemophilus influenza, and Marxella catarrhalis. Viral infections included herpes simplex 1, adenovirus, rhinovirus, human papilloma virus, virus a la zoster, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus and coxsackievirus. Fungal mostly included candida species. And then moving on to the non-infectious side, benign conditions included cystic lymphoepithelial disease and then IgE mediated diseases and then malignant, um, as I'm sure you have picked up, includes Kaposi sarcoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So moving on to our first um, area of discussing discussion, I'm going to discuss the oropharyngeal manifestations of um, HIV in, uh, of ENT in HIV. So because this is the most um, common um, anatomical area affected by e, um, HIV, it's just important to to remember how to adequately examine the oral cavity. So you want to, in the mouth, you want to retract, illuminate, and visualize. You want to look at the buccal mucosa. You want to look at Stenson's duct opening and the opening of each livery gland into the mouth. You need to look at the gums and the teeth. You need to look at the floor of the mouth. You need to look at Coffin's corner, which is the posterior corner of the floor of the mouth. You need to look at the tongue dorsum, inferior and lateral, lateral surface, and then also the heart palate and the floor of the mouth and the submandibular gland. 
And in the oropharynx, we want to visualize the soft palate, the tonsils and the uvula, the tongue base and the posterior pharyngeal wall. So this is just a quick picture to remind us all about the anatomy of the oropharyngeal cavity. Um, it's quite self-explanatory. I'm not really going to elaborate. So the, the, the <clears throat> disease manifestations that we're going to discuss today include oral candida, oral heroleukoplakia, oral herpes simplex virus, oral um, human papilloma virus, tonsillitis, Kaposi sarcoma, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So the first <clears throat> um, disease process is oral candidiasis. There is three types of oral candidiasis, including Pseudomembranous candidiasis, erythematous candidiasis, and angular chiliitis. So it's important to note that the oropharynx, hypopharynx, and larynx can all be affected by um, candida infection. Um, in adults, it occurs in about 30 to 90 percent, and in children, 22.5 to 83.3 percent. And it's mostly diagnosed clinically. So um, pseudomonas is scanning pseudomon. Uh, Pseudomembranous, sorry, that was a, um, a spelling error. Uh, candidiasis is caused by um, candida albicans, candida glabrata, and candida dubelensi. Um, also, oral pseudomembranous candidiasis is the most common fungal infection in HIV disease. It has been associated with more frequent progression to HIV to, from HIV to AIDS, AIDS, sorry. Um, and it is also used as a clinical marker to define the severity of HIV infection. The, so the description of pseudomembranous candidiasis is creamy white curd-like blocks on the buccal mucosa tongue and oral mucosa surf mucosal surfaces. And um, the blocks can be wiped away, leaving a red or bleeding um, area. So as you can see there in the picture on the right, and then just a sort of note on the treatment, we want to improve oral hygiene and we want to use um, nystatin suspension, one milliliter per os. Um, it's just important that the suspension gets into contact with the FA areas affected and you want to use it six hours and after meals for seven days. This is according to the EML guidelines. Then moving on to erythematous candidiasis, it's the caused by the same um, organism. Um, it's um, also, it's gonna be described as a red flat subtle lesion uh, on the dorsal surface of the tongue or on the hard or soft palate. The lesion often involves two opposing surfaces. So looking at these images, it was, I had to look twice to actually see the pathology, but as they note, it's a subtle lesion, so you have to um, actively go look for it. And then the, the um, treatment is the same as um, pseudomembranous candidiasis. Then um, angular chiliasis, um, chiliitis, sorry, also caused by the same organisms. It can be described as erythema and or fissuring of the corners of the mouth. It may coexist with erythematous or pseudomembranous candidiasis, and it persists for an extensive period of time if left untreated. And then the treatment involves using a topical antifungal cream applied directly to the affected areas two times a day for two weeks. I just included uh, esophageal candidiasis because it, um, they often also occur together. Um, so the organism is candidiasis species and the diagnosis is clinical and histopathological. Um, they usually present with odonophagia and dysphagia. Clinically, it's a white or yellowish adherent plaques. It's similar to um, pseudomembranous candidiasis and the treatment is hydration, fluconazole 200 milligrams per hour daily for two weeks. Then moving on to oral le aerial leukoplakia. Um, so oral leukoplakia is a condition that is almost pathognomonic of HIV infection, and it often indicates progression to age. AIDS. Sorry. Um, so the lesion most um, frequently appears on the lateral aspect of the tongue uh, with a thick, vertically correlated whitish block. So it's um, caused by Epstein-Barr virus. It can be diagnosed by um, 
potassium hydroxide preparations of surface, surface scrapings and um, the, bio, um, the biopsy of the lesion. It's usually asymptomatic and doesn't require treatment, but it is quite important for, important, important for diagnostic and prognostic implications. Using, um, using uh, sorry, moving on to oral herpes simplex virus. Um, so this um, manifestation uh, or the eruption is correlated with a fall in CD4 count. Um, it often causes widespread infection and oral lesions is common. So the lip versus the mouth presentations differ. So on the lip, um, it starts as a small crop of vesicles that rupture to produce small painful ulcerations that may coalesce and then on the mouth, the mouth lesions on keratinized or fixed tissues, including the heart, palate, and gums, should prompt suspicion of um, herpes simplex um, virus infection. So as we can see, if the organism is herpes simplex virus one, the diagnosis is mostly clinically, and in treatment includes rinsing the mouth with homemade salt, salt water mouthwash for one minute twice a day, and they, you can prepare this mouthwash by using, by use, using half a teaspoon of um, table salt in a glass of lukewarm water. Um, then also, um, we want to ensure adequate hydration of the patient. In, in, in children, you, can, um, you should think about changing them to a fluid diet, and then it's important to avoid acidic drinks. You can also give... Um, paracetamol and then um, the EM guidance um, uh, guidelines, uh, EML guidelines um, say that you should use um, on the lip, you can cover the lesions with petroleum, petroleum jelly and then um, you can give the patient, um, if it's severe infection, a cycle over 400 milligrams per hour, eight hourly for seven days. Okay, so um, oral herp, uh, human papilloma virus. Um, um, this, uh, the organism is, um, as mentioned in the name, human papilloma virus. The types um, of HPV that cause um, the, this manifestation is um, showed on the screen. I'm not going to go through all of those ones. Then it's also common when the CD4 is lower, it can, um, present as papillomas, focal epithelial hyperplasia, or condylomata acuminatum. The treatment is not well defined, but um, it has been suggested to treat with pedophilin, cryotherapy, and surgery. Okay, next up we have tonsillitis. So tonsillitis can either be viral or bacterial. As we can see, viral um, tonsillitis occur in 50 to 80 percent of cases and bacterial in 15 to 30% of cases. The viral um, organisms include adenovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus, rhinovirus, coronavirus, and influenza. Bacterial um, organisms include Streptococcus pyogen, pyogenes, Neisseria gonorrhea, diphtheria, mycoplasma, and pneumonia. So <clears throat> tonsillitis presents as a red painful throat uh, or enlarged inflamed tonsils. White pus exudates, either spots or patches may be present. Tender anterior cervical lymph adenopathy may also be present. So the diagnosis of tonsillitis is primarily clinically. And then the treatment also includes the salt water mouthwash. Um, prepared as in the same way as, um, in, as mentioned before, then um, it's important to maintain hydration of the patient at, as well as giving analgesia. Now, it's important that we don't treat all um, tonsillitis cases with antibiotics. So the indications for antibiotics include enlarged tonsils plus at least one of the following criteria. Exudates on either tonsils with no cost cough and no runny nose. And the, uh, these patients are at risk for rheumatic fever if between the ages formed from three to 21 years. So the um, antibiotic 
of choice is benzodiazepine penicillin, 1.2 mu IMI stat, or you can use amoxicillin one gram per hour, 12 hourly for 10 days. And if they have a penicillin allergy, you can use azithromycin 500 milligram daily for three days. Then, um, uh, as we know, tonsillectomy is also often um, um, provided for patients. So the, the tonsillectomy guidelines, according to the key action statements, include key action statement one, um, whereas the clinician may recommend tonsillectomy for recurrent throat infections with a frequency of at least seven episodes in the past year, or at least five episodes per year for two years, or at least three episodes per year for three years with documentation of them um, in the medical record for each episode of sore throat and more than one of the following, including temperature of more than 38.3, cervical lymph adenopathy, tonsillar exudate, or positive test for group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. Um, <clears throat> then it's also um, then according to the key action statements, clinicians should assess a child with recurrent throat infection who has, does not meet the key, the criteria in key action statement one for modifying factors that may nonetheless favor tonsillectomy, which may include, but are not limited to multiple antibiot um, antibiotic allerg allergies and intolerance, periodic fever, aphthous, Somatitis, pharyngitis, and adenitis, or a issue of more than one peritonsal abscesses. Sorry. Um, so then, then it's also just important to look out for the red flags um, that can um, should alarm you, alert you to the the um, complications of tonsillitis. So the tonsillopharyngitis. So um, uh, the red flags. Uh, may indicate separative or invasive complications, including peritonsillar abscess, retropharyngeal abscess. And in these cases, it's, it's important to refer to ENT, um, consider empiric IV antibiotics and steroid, and pre prepare for a difficult airway management. So the red flags, um, as shown there on the right, include stressmus, drooling, asymmetric tonsils, a displaced uvula, unilateral facial swelling, muffled or hot potato speech, and clinical features of sepsis and immunosuppression. So moving on to Kaposi sarcoma. Um, so uh, as we can see in the pictures um, on, on the screen, Kaposi sarcoma can be macular, nodular, or raised, and ulcerated. The color of the lesions can range from red to purple. Early lesions tend to be red, flat, and asymptomatic, with the color becoming darker as the lesion ages. The heart palate, gingival, and buccal mucosa, the do and the dorsum of the tongue can be affected. So Kaposi sarcoma is um, the most com common oral malignancy in HIV. 20% of HIV positive patients, the first clinical site it is the first clinical site of Kaposi sarcoma and it may occur concomitantly with skin and visceral involvement in up to 70% of patients. Um, so Kaposi Hi. Okay, sorry. Um, Hi. Kaposi sarcoma uh, is associated with herpes virus and was proven uh, to be- Um, so, Kaposi sarcoma can either be symptomatic or asymptomatic. As the lesions progress, they can become symptomatic due to trauma or infection. The diagnosis is made with a biopsy, um, and then treatment, incl treatment include improved oral hygiene, topical injections of chemotherapeutic agents, including venblastine sulfate, even surgical removal or radiation therapy can be considered for treatment. Systemic chemotherapy should be reserved for patients with both oral and extraoral Kaposi sarcoma. 
Moving on to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's the second most common malignancy in HIV. Um, it can be single or multiple ulceration or edema lesions within the oral cavity. The onset is sudden and they, they usually cause no pain and grow quickly. So they can present with fever, night sweats, and significant weight loss, as well as the, the presentation that I just described. And then it's often difficult to diagnose because it can be a mistaken for inflammation of mucous membranes or the periodontium. The lesions may disappear and reappear. Okay, next up, we're going to talk about the autological manifestations. So this is just a nice picture uh, reminding us all about the anatomy of the ear, including the outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The areas of discussion for today includes otitis externa, herpes otica, and otitis media. So otitis externa, uh, it's a mild infection. Mild, sorry, mild infections usually involve localized scaly skin with erythema, where a severe infection can lead to complete occlusion of the external um, order canal or spreading and of the infection can cause pinna cellulitis. Um, diagnosis uh, for HIV should be suspected of patients with painful otorrhea not responsive to treatment for simple otitis externa. So then the organisms um, identified include, include Pseudomonas and Staph aureus. Treatment include the bridement, ciprofloxacin and oral, 750 milligrams, 12 hourly, and um, refer if there's no resolvement. Um, complicated, complications include con conductive hearing loss. And then otitis externa can also become a male malignant. It's common in immunosuppressed patients. They present with a persistent discharge, a deep boring pain and granuloma of the external ear canal. Um, so the, the organism is also um, pseudomonas. The treatment is the same as in the previous slide and the complication um, can include skull-based osteomyelitis with central um, nervous system neuropathies. Moving on to herpes zoster otica. Um, uh, Varicella zoster is the organism identified. They usually present with otalgia, which is um, described as a burning pain for three to seven days. Uh, sorry, and after three to seven days, um, vesicles may appear. It's obvious or it can be inside the ear canal. So um, adequate examination is also important in this case. They can also present like Bell's palsy with vertigo and dizziness. So the treatment inclu includes a cyclover, oral steroids, and um, corneal protection. Complications include um, um, nerve palsies, including cranial nerve 5, 7, and 8. Moving on to otitis media. This is just a nice graph. Um, found in a study done in 20, 2021 about on the incidence and clinical features of hepatitis media in patients with HIV infection. So um, uh, from this slide, we can see against the background of a greater number of exacerbations of a chronic otitis media for patients with HIV and AIDS, it's also um, characterized by higher incidence of severe forms of the disease as showed um, or as will be discussed um, in the next slide. So like the, the table, uh, the graph shows us um, the amount of exacerbations of middle ear disease per year in patients without HIV against the, the, the background of HIV AIDS. So in patients with HIV and AIDS, it's much more common than in patients without HIV and AIDS. Um, so this is... Um, a discussion on acute otitis media. They present with otalgia, hearing loss, red, a red bulging eardrum, eardrum perforation, and fever. The diagnosis is mostly clinical. Um, the organism includes strep pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, Marixola gratorolis, and Staph aureus. The treatment includes dry mopping, amoxicillin 1.5 gram, 
per OS12 hourly for five days. And if there's no response, you can give Augmentin. Seven, seven, uh, sorry, 857 um, uh, and 125 milligrams per OS12 hourly for five to 10 days. If there is a penicillin allergy, you can give us a dithromycin, 500 milligrams per OS for three days. You can also give citrazine and paracetamol. So it's important to um, refer these patients is that if there's no response to um, augmentum, if the no pain relief despite treatment, if there's a bulgy eardrum not responding to treatment after 24 hours, if there's swelling and pain on palpation of the mastoid process, and if there's recurrent otitis media. So as we can see in the picture, um, this is an example of a titus, acute otitis media. There's a pacification of the membrane, there's a bulging membrane, and there's prominent dilated vessels. Chronic otitis media, we get um, three different types, with a cholestoma, without a cholestoma, and then TB. They all usually present um, with autorrhea, so it's usually a discharge from the ear for longer than two weeks. So cholestoma is described as skin in the middle ear. It desquamates into the middle ear. It, there's a defect in the tympanic membrane when it goes in and it causes a chronic autorrhea. It is resistant to um, um, the normal chronic otitis media treatment. So the, the, the um, organism responsible for chronic otitis media, it's usually a mixed bag of organisms. It can include pseudomonas, staph aureus, proteus, um, and Klebsiella pneumonia. Um, then at a, a primary healthcare level, the, the treatment described is dry mopping. Oh, it's important to note that a wet ear canal, canal can't heal. You want to use acetic acid 2% in alcohol, topically three to four drops into ear, each ear, six or the affected ear six hourly for five days. Then you can also use ciprofloxacin drops, three milligrams per milliliter, three to four drops into each ear, eight hourly for seven days after mopping. You can give um, symptomatic treatment um, with paracetamol. And then it's important to note that TB, um, chronic otitis media, is resistant otorrhea. It, it, it occurs with 50% with pulmonary TB, there's tissue necrosis and exposed bone or osteitis. And there can be a chronic uh, cranial nerve seven palsy. It's important to recognize this, investigate it, and the treatment is TB treatment. Okay, so complications of acute um, and chronic otitis media include mastoiditis, which can lead to um, intracranial sepsis, meningitis, and abscesses, labyrinthitis, lateral sinus thrombosis, and pitrocytitis, um, and then cranial nerve 7 palsy. Um, so on the right in the images, it just shows um, why these um, complications is um, possible. It just shows the close proximation of the um, ear canal to the affected areas. Um, so severe and complicated forms of ENT disease occur at a high frequency against the background of ENT infection. And it can account for about 23%. Other complications that develop in the background of HIV, like I said, is meningitis, which can occur in 13.4% and 7.7% brain abscesses and 1.9% there can be severe sepsis and up to 9.6% of cases can be fatal. And just for completeness sake, I included a titus media with effusion. This is not an infectious process. It's a sterile fluid in the middle ear behind the tympanic membrane. It often occurs in children with eustachian tube problems. There's no perforation, but and there is a discharge, and the treatment is just with promise. Moving on to the nasal manifestations. This is just a nice picture reminding us all about the anatomy of 
the um, nasal cavity. For discussion today, I'm going to discuss rhinosinusitis and allergic rhinitis. So rhinosinusitis um, can be classified also into viral and bacterial. So viral is um, described as being acute viral and then bacterial is also called acute post-viral rhinosinusitis. So acute viral rhinosinusitis can be caused by rhinovirus, influenza, adenovirus, coxsackie, herpes simplex virus, and varicella zoster virus. Um, the bacterial, um, the post-viral, uh, acute post-viral rhinosinusitis or bacterial rhinosinusitis can be caused by strep pneumonia, hemophilus, influenza, staph aureus, and marixella. So the patients present with inflammation of the nasal cavity and paranasal sinuses. They can have a blocked nose, facial pain, and fatigue. There's impaired ciliary function, and this poses the risk of secondary bacterial infection. So a common cold or acute viral rhinosinusitis is defined as duration of symptoms of less than 10 days. Acute post-viral post rhinosinusitis is defined as an increase in symptoms after the five days or persistent symptoms after 10 days with less of 12, than 12 weeks duration. So <clears throat> um, this is just a slide on the um, with about the treatment. So the treatment include, uh, if it's virals, viral, there will be spontaneous resolvement, but if it's bacterial, um, the EML guidelines recommend that we give amoxicillin 500 milligrams eight hourly for five days. If there's a penicillin allergy, you can give azithromycin 500 milligrams per hour eight hourly for three days. You can give symptomatic treatment um, in uh, uh, with uh, oxymethazoline two drops in each nas nostril six to eight hourly. You can give um, normal saline nose drops, and paracetamol. Complications of um, rhinosinus, um, yeah, complications include orbital cellulitis, orbital abscess, cavernous sinus thrombosis, and meningitis, and intracranial abscess. So the picture on the right is just a, a example of orbital, cellula, orbital cellulitis. So it's important to refer patients that has a fever higher than 38 degrees, a poor response after five days of treatment. Um, complications, uh, as noted above, and uh, edema over the sinus, recurrent sinusitis, and meningeal ir irritation. Uh, moving on to allergic rhinitis. Um, so the etiology of allergic rhinitis um, is it's a type one hypersensitivity reaction, so it's IgE mediated. So in HIV people, although, although the cellular immunity is depressed, there seems to be an increase in polyclonal B cell activity with increased circulating immune complexes and increased level of IgE. This high levels of IgE then leads to um, incre um, increased IgE-mediated allergic symptoms. So pa the patients present with sneezing, watery rhinorrhea, a blocked nose, and treatment um, includes includes avoiding the allergen. And then you can use, as noted, um, flucatazone 100 mi um, micrograms, one spray in each nostril 12 hourly. If the patient is on a protease inhibitor, they recommend rather using leclametazone one spray 12 hourly in each nostril. You can give chlorpheniramine four milligrams per os eight to six to eight hourly. Oxymethazoline, 0.05% intranasal at night for five days. And uh, if you want to use a non sedating antihistamine, you can use cetirazine, 10 milligram per hour daily. Next up, we have the neck manifestations. Um, so I'll be discussing HIV lymph adenopathy first. So HIV lymph adenopathy. Um, it's uh, defined as in adults as lymph adenopathy greater than one centimeter, centimeter of unexplained etiology involving two or more non-contagious reasons um, present for at least three months. So this occurs, HIV lymph adenopathy in, in, in 
occurs in 70% of patients in the initial period after seroconversion. Um, the indications for fine needle aspiration include rapid enlargement, domi a dominant node, asymmetrical lymphadenopathy, a firm non-mobile node, and recent weight loss. Then the next manifestation um, in the neck uh, includes parotid enlargement. So parotid gland enlargement is commonly encountered in HIV-infected adults and children who are not um, on antiretroviral therapy. The HIV-associated um, cystic lymphoepithelial disease, um, it's described as being a benign lymphoepithelial cyst is a disease process unique to HIV-infected individuals, and the etiology is thought to be related to a lymphoid response to HIV. Patients usually present with bilateral painless paratomegaly, and except for the cosmetic deformity, these lesions are completely asymptomatic. The natural progression of the disease is unknown. The management of these lesions include confirming the diagnosis with an ultrasound or a fine needle aspiration. And an ultrasound will clearly show a multiple cystic lesion within the parotid gland. Um, and then the treatment includes aspiration or low dose radiotherapy. Treatment is guided by the severity of, of the disease and by the cosmetic deformity. Then we have um, tuberculosis lymphadenitis or scrolufa. Um, the organism is, as stated in the name, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, so TB is responsible for up to 43% of peripheral lymph adenopathy in, in resource-limited settings. Um, it um, can be isolated peripheral tuberculosis lymph adenopathy, but it is usually due to a reactivation of the disease at the site seeded hematologically during primary tuberculosis infection, perhaps years earlier, but it can also con occur concomitantly with pulmonary TB. So these patients, they present with, um, besides the lymph adenopathy, they present with fever, fatigue, and loss of weight. Um, and then also, the, the lymph nodes can occur in the supraclavicular fossa, the posterior triangle, and multiple lymph nodes is, is often um, present. It can be bilateral and it can have trained sinuses. So the diagnosis is made on a, a fine needle aspiration or an excision biopsy. We then use a zeal Nielsen, Nielsen staining, PCR, and culture. The treatment is um, rifampicin and isonided, um, the person might end Istanbul for two months and then just rifampicin, rifampicin and isonided for four months. So just as a short summary, so it's important to note that ENT manifestations is common in HIV. Um, the lower the CD4 count, the more in the manifestations are present. And the routine organisms dominate when it comes to infections of the ear, nose, and throat. HIV positive patients should be treated with the same antibiotic as HIV negative patients. And it wasn't mentioned before, but all of the manifestations should also be treated with ARPs. Thank you. This is my references. Thanks very much, Dr. Noll. Um, yeah, obviously a large, large subject matter and always made it a little bit more complicated with the, the HIV involved as well. Um, so I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna open the floor for, for comments and for, uh, for questions and input. Um, I think what mm -hmm. we'll do is, uh, I think we might, uh, sorry, let's just open up here. I think if anyone has a question, if they don't mind um, raising their hand um, as such on the chat, um, or sorry, on the, on your screen and then what we'll also do is we've got a chance to speak here so 
I think possibly let's start in, in Ward 5, if you allow me that preference, um, and then we will um, get going to the rest of the team. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> if anyone here wants to ask a question or give a comment, we just need to come to the front with our microphone. Thank you very much for the presentation. I just want to make a small comment about the otological manifestation. So while it is true that ear infections are not a definitive indicator of HIV, it's been proved that people living with the virus uh, can experience early and more frequent this manifestation if you compare with people without the virus. For that reason, if you have a patient that is coming to your healthcare facility with a history of recurring open respiratory tract infections, you need to offer the HIV counseling test, especially if the patient also has a history of symptoms and signs of HIV acute infection like fever, malaise, I mean, oral genital ulcerations, lymphadenopathies, et cetera. And we cannot forget that people with a high viral load, low CD4 count, and other comorbidities associated like cancer on chemotherapy, is the patient is on treatment with TB for a resistant type with amikacin, and other autoimmune conditions, autoimmune conditions like lupus, scleroderma, um, rheumatoid arthritis, among others, all of these can weaken the immune system of the patient and make them more susceptible of opportunistic infections. And the patient can have some complications like conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. Thank you very much, Dr. Simi. Um, anyone else in Ward 5? Thank you, Dr. Denier. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Quite a very extensive uh, topic. Let me just uh, one or two areas of emphasis in terms of the application to the general uh, practitioners who are not at tertiary level. Um, use of podophilin in the mouth, you know, under the uh, oral what? Do you want to show the picture again? It's usually, they are usually very, very extensive. And therefore, uh, the clinician attending to these patients needs to take detailed sexual history using the WHO five Ps. And the focus here is to emphasize and get to the bottom of the etiology or the mechanism of transmission. Often than not, this is largely due to oral sex. And you, as you can see, they are quite very, very extensive. Podophilin uh, in the mouth is considered unsafe, and therefore that will not should not actually appear there. You know, um, there are better preparations that are less that are safer in the mouth. But when the lesions are very few and isolated, cryotherapy or, or, or uh, or simply applying laser directly on those. So, which means in the district and the uh, CAC, such patients were actually verified, you know, but uh, we do not encourage podophilin in the mouth. Even in on the skin, it's a very, very corrosive. And when the skin is broken, also than not, there is more increase in absorption and that in itself uh, could cause poisoning for, for such patients. So imiquimoid uh, 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 preparation, which does well in terms which is glad, you know, it has some significant effect on the virus itself, uh, uh, is better off on the, the mucosa and it's better, it's well tolerated. But again, it's not within the uh, EML and are not available in most of the facilities. So otherwise, uh, five fluorouracil would be a better option in that category of patients. Now, the other aspect that is important for us to know is that in HPV, we can largely prevent uh, 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 the spread of HPV, especially with the new vaccination and the school runs, uh, school program that is going on before the age of nine to 12 years. That will equally help, especially if they've got the quadrivalent uh, uh, type, 
uh, you know, uh, get, a, get a sale, that will actually uh, help in terms of preventing, uh, uh, especially these wards, not only just for uh, cervical cancer prevention in women. So that's uh, another aspect in terms of prevention. The other aspect that uh, I think it's important to emphasize is happy simplest. Even though happy simplest one, you want to show the picture again, is typically believed to be caused by happy simplest one. Uh, even two can occur because sexual practice nowadays are not what it used to be. And mouth to genital means that uh, 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 Type two can equally infect the mucosa, especially the palate, the gum, the, the, the tongue itself, you know, causing serious uh, uh, ulcer pairs or, you know, uh, ulceration starting with the blister and then, which is highly very, very painful. And therefore, we need to actually uh, manage these patients uh, appropriately. The aspect of phosphagia canadiasis, again, it's. Uh, in those patients who are presented with fluorid candidiasis in the mouth. In addition to that, we're now having odinophagia as a symptom, painful swallowing. We do not need endoscopy you know, diagnosing those patients. Therefore, yes, in this a patient with this type of uh, pseudo, uh, this pseudomembranous, not pseudo, yeah, it's I... okay. Yeah, we should correct it. So, with patients like this, with typical, uh, in addition to this, having problem to swallow or having pain in the, in the, in the you know, in the, you know, uh, swallowing, we will make assumption that the patient has got uh, tension into the esophagus. And it, this has implication in terms of your, uh, this is, this patient was obtained at endoscopy. And they, this is a very expensive process, which will not, in most cases, we don't need endoscopy to make that uh, judgment call clinically. So you would then go ahead and treat us indicated there. Um, but again, it's important to make a distinction that the WHO clinical stage will change from three, you know, to four in that particular patient if you make that uh, distinction. And uh, maybe you later come came back to touch on the, the uh, Ramsey on syndrome or what you call. Uh, a piece of uh, oticos, you know. Often than not, typically a patient will come with blisters around the pina, you know, which may extend into the oral canal. And typically those patients may have, in addition, facial paralysis, which we must be able to pick up quickly and, and uh, make a quick diagnosis. But again, not just only the oral treatment, Pain control is crucial for patients with chingles, and evidence suggests that the pain may last up to three to six months in those patients. So we must not uh, trivialize pain of our patient. In fact, as a matter of fact, we need to, as clinician, we need to be able to use appropriate uh, 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 pain uh, assessment scale, you know, so that we can assess the severity and treat the pain uh, they are not using analgesia used to be titrated to the severity of pain of these patients. And they, you know, uh, anybody who has actually had uh, chingles before would know what the pain looks like. But I assume a lot of our doctors have never had it. So often than not, there is a chance that we may not, we may undertreat the pain in this category of, of, of patients. Now, um, Issues around uh, 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 sore throat, especially when in the oropharynx area, presents a different dilemma for diagnosis. You know, it's very, we can easily put everybody in the same bucket basket of uh, uh, tonsillitis. But again, if you don't know the sexual history of patients, you are going to miss unnecessary gonorrhea, you know, causing pharyngitis, you know, in those patients. And of course, isolated lesions that are painless on the thumb or in the palate could just be syphilis due to oral sex. So these are broader picture of what is happening in the current generation or in the current uh, uh, generation of patients we are managing. And of course, you touched on the parotid, uh, parotid enlargement. Parotid enlargement is largely, uh, especially when it's painless and bilateral or symmetrical, 
It is largely due to lymphocytic infiltration, what is called diffused infiltrative lymphocytic syndrome, you know? And it's not just only that, it's not just only the parotid that is affected, even the thyroid gland may be affected, you know? And uh, in, addition to, in addition to that, um, those patients typically we have dry, they may have uh, dry uh, eyes, you know, and the tongue is equally very dry. But that's the, will be the reason uh, for, con for consultation beyond just only the cosmesis of the, of the swelling that they do have. But the one, the lung of the patient, especially younger kids, gets damaged due to these, you know, uh, 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 lymphocytic infiltration. And those patients may re remain at sick and breathless for a long period of time. In fact, they may be oxygen dependent if they do not die from, from this. So it's very important that we should be able to recognize uh, these patients and, and refer them appropriately. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Janu. Um, definitely some important points to, to, to remember. Um, is there anyone else in Ward 5 and our meeting on this side to comment? Um, or should we open for the Zoom, Zoom team? All right. I think let's, um, let's do some Zoom comments if anyone would like. Just unmute yourself and give us some nice input. Not seeing any hands. Any, any, any question from the chat? Let's have a look. In the chat, chat is just the uh, attendance. Would anyone last like to ask or give input? Always appreciated. that might be happy us all right thank you everyone for joining us um the uh, presentation has been recorded and thanks very much for putting your mp numbers on the chat we'll make sure they're recorded and uh, sorted for cpd thank you everyone have a good day <laughs>